Hi everyone and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Lana and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. While you may like to take notes, we'd like to remind you that today's presentation is being recorded and you'll be sent a copy of the recording and presentation slides in the days following this webinar. Throughout the presentation, I'd encourage you to ask any questions you may have for our presenters via the Q&A function through Zoom. There'll be time for our presenters to answer your questions at the end of today's session. If you are interested in extra tips and strategies to help you succeed in an interview, we recommend that you visit USQ Social Hub. This site houses hundreds of blogs, presentations, magazines and videos that contain tips and advice to help you make the most of your time at university and succeed in your career. Social Hub is free to access and you don't need to have a social media account or USQ student number in order to access any of the materials. Also, everyone who does register today for our Beyond the Books online series will go into the draw to win a $50 Coles Meyer gift card. So if you are participating today, you will already be in the draw. But if you are listening to this as a recording, I encourage you to register for any of our other webinars from the series to go into the draw as well. But with me today is Michael Healy, Employability Coordinator at USQ. Michael has been supporting students to develop their resumes, improve their interview skills and succeed in their careers for over five years and is currently completing his PhD on careers and employability. Welcome, Michael, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Lana. It's um, really good to be back here. I think um, some people in the, in the group attending today may have um, attended some of the other webinars that I've been doing in this series. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a broader overview of networking, um, talking about both networking online and networking in person. A few weeks before that, I spoke about um, what the variety of things that you can do to improve your employability. One key one of which was to actually engage in networking and build your professional connections. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of interest from students in LinkedIn in particular, because I think we all know that LinkedIn is a useful tool for professional networking and putting yourself out there. But it's quite a big website. There's a lot of uh, stuff uh, in it and not everybody is confident in using it. So that's what I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about, um, explaining some of the key features and explaining a few tips on how to use it well and um, making a few uh, warnings about how people don't use it well. So um, hope, I hope people get something from that. And there will be a few questions along the way to see what you're currently doing as well. So at any time also just use that question feature if there's something that comes up and um, I'll get to you when I can. So I'd like to start by asking a quick question of the audience um, just to get a gauge of where you are at the moment. How confident are you that you know how to use LinkedIn well? You'll see a poll come up on your screen. Screen, You just have to click one of those options and we'll look at the results in a moment. <clears throat> okay, we've got a good mix of results. There's quite a few people here who don't use LinkedIn at all, but obviously curious to learn more about it. Um, and then quite a few people who are not at all or not much. Um, and then we have a few experts by the looks of things and a few people who use it a little bit or, uh, you know, a little confident, but recognize that they can learn more. So I hope that I can do something to um, add to your toolbox in terms of um, your knowledge about LinkedIn and, and networking in, in a general sense as well. I'm going to start by introducing a couple of useful resources, um, and these are actually from LinkedIn. They're really fantastic. So there's a couple of ebooks at this link: um, How to Kickstart Your Career, Job Search Skills for Students, Interviewing Tips for Students. And then there's also a whole bunch of videos and cheat sheets. Now these are made by LinkedIn, so bear that in mind. They are essentially advertising, but they do actually have really high quality advice and recommendations in them. So I'll just open that link up. So at this uh, website, students.linkedin.com, you'll see that it's LinkedIn for higher education. And the landing page has these, um, these three eBooks. The eBooks are really accessible. They're, they're completely free. You don't even have to sign up or provide your email or anything like that. They're not massive, um, but they do have a good amount of detail on how to use LinkedIn um, to set goals, to be proactive, to do research, to connect with people, to figure yourself out and do a little bit of um, promotion. So I'd highly recommend that you have it, you download those. They won't take long to um, skim through. At the bottom of this page, you'll see an additional link 
tips, our tip sheets and videos to get you started. And these are also really useful because they are very straightforward, very brief, and they don't take a lot of time. And in particular, things like this profile checklist. So um, I'll be talking about some key things on your profile in just a moment. But if you were to download this PDF, in fact, I might put a link to that in the chat, just so everybody has it. There you go. So that runs through the key things on a LinkedIn profile, gives you a few ideas of what you can do to make it a little bit better. And the advice that I'm about to give you um, will be in broad alignment with that. So those resources are there. They're completely free. I'd recommend that you go to those. Um, you, you're not going to find better advice about how to use LinkedIn um, than from LinkedIn itself. So I'm going to start by talking about building your profile. I'm just actually going to switch from switch to Chrome. There we go. So there's a couple of key things to focus on your profile. A LinkedIn profile does, um, LinkedIn does a pretty good job of helping you build your profile. It's not that difficult. You follow the prompts, you put the information in the right place, but there's a couple of places that are more important than others. Um, the first one might be fairly obvious. It's your photo. And um, there's actually been research done on LinkedIn photos, believe it or not. They wanted to find out what photos are more memorable than others. And the result was quite simple. It comes down to one thing, and that's a smile. They found that the, the biggest thing that would make people engage with and remember a LinkedIn profile photo was having a friendly outlook, having a smile. Um, and in order to see the smile, it has to be a photo of basically just your head and shoulders. Um, so a mistake that some people make on in terms of LinkedIn profiles is to be too far away from the camera. So they take photos like in, a, in their workplace, sometimes you'll see like, I know a zoologist who's got a photo of them in a zoo, which is really great, but you can't actually see them or recognize their face. And so LinkedIn is all about connecting with people and networking, so it's important that people can see you. So a head and shoulders photo with a smile, don't crop a party photo, don't take a photo of you and your friends at a wedding and then try and crop everybody else out. That usually has a pretty poor effect. Just take your phone outside, get a friend on a nice sunny day to take a, a couple of nice photos of you. And it doesn't have to be super professional. So you, men don't have to wear a shirt and a tie. You don't have to dress up for them. Just, you know, make it look clean and tidy. And most of all, look into the camera and smile. You want to be approachable. Your name is obviously your name, you, uh, you might not do something to change that. Although if you do go by a different name, then LinkedIn, it's okay to use that on LinkedIn. So if you are someone that uses a nickname or, you know, maybe people call you by your middle name or something like that, um, or you have, if, if you're from another country and you use an English name when you're in Australia, um, you can put that on LinkedIn. There's no rule requiring you to have the name that appears on your passport on your LinkedIn profile. So use the name that people know you by or you want people to know you by. The next part of a LinkedIn profile is really important and it's the headline. And if you look at my profile over here on the left of the screen, underneath my name, you can see it says careers and employability educator, um, EDD, which stands for doctor of education student. That's the headline. And so that's only a couple of words. You don't have a lot of room there, um, but that's really fundamental because there's three things that people can see when they're browsing around the timeline of LinkedIn. And if you look at my, my timeline, you'll see what they are. They are the person's name, the person's photo, and the person's headline. So that's really important because it's the first communication people will get about what you do or what you're all about. There's a couple of mistakes that people make with those. The first mistake that students make is to just write student. They'll have their photo, their name, and then it will say student underneath that. Sometimes it might say student at USQ. And that's a mistake because it's not actually very inform informative. If you're going to say that you're a student, you need to at least tell us what you're studying. And it's also maybe not the best idea to present yourself as a student because even if you're studying a degree, you are an emerging professional. You should have an idea of what you want to be or, or, or what you have to offer. So think carefully about how you're going to describe yourself in just one line. Avoid using the word student. If you're working in a, in a job that is not very relevant to your career goals, then you should also avoid using that. 
So now and again, I'll see, see a student in particular who has something like checkout operator at Coles, which is, you know, accurate. It, it is the job that they do, but at the same time, it's not part of their professional identity. That's just their part-time job. They would be better off saying a, a commerce student or an aspiring um, IT specialist or a future physiotherapist or something like that. So think carefully about the message that you're sending with that small collection of words. Um, job titles can also be challenging because some people's job titles don't make an awful lot of sense. Um, I know that from working at a university, there's a lot of people at the university where I know what they do, but if I look at their job title, it's not actually really telling me much. So job titles are useful from an internal point of view in terms of your organization, but they don't necessarily need to be what you write on your LinkedIn profile. For example, I've worked in um, three different universities now in the careers and employability team doing different um, activities. I have never actually had a contract that says careers and employability educator. I've never had a job title of educator, but I've decided for myself that that's what's important to me. So that's what I'm going to use. You are not obligated to use your job title as your headline. So those are the three things that you'll see from the timeline, the name, the photo, and the headline, they are really key because they are what are gonna, those are the things that are gonna inspire people or attract people to actually click on your name and take a look at your profile. I'm gonna try and avoid clicking on people's names um, in this webinar because I don't wanna broadcast uh, Judy Kay's LinkedIn profile to the world. I'm gonna use my own as an example. So let's say someone has read your headline, they, they're curious to learn more. The next thing that they're gonna focus on is this part here, the summary. The summary is a really, really important part of your LinkedIn profile because few people are gonna be interested enough to read the whole profile. You know, um, on, on a computer, on, online, we don't read everything, we're scrolling all the time. We really just wanna get the key information. And so this is where you give your little story or you give the synopsis or the summary of what you're all about. Um, and it can be the bigger picture. It doesn't necessarily have to be a list of um, your jobs. It doesn't have to be a list of your skills. In fact, it's often really useful here to talk about some other things such as your motivation. Why do you do what you do? Um, what, what, what energizes you? What are your values? Um, how do you do the work that you do? So this is where you can describe sort of your specialty or how you approach your work. This is really useful because that's going to, people are going to read that um, and from that they're going to maybe decide whether they want to connect with you, decide whether they want to continue reading the profile. Um, but also by doing the work of thinking about what you're going to write here, you're actually doing much more than just preparing your LinkedIn profile. You're also preparing what people call your elevator pitch. Um, you're preparing some of the stuff that might go into your cover letter for jobs and you're preparing um, a response to that first question of any job interview, which will be, tell me about yourself. So the material here is really just that little statement of, this is who I am and what I'm all about. And it's gonna be a very useful collection of um, sentences that you'll use time and time again. So the two things that you have to probably think more carefully about is your summary and your headline. So those, those are key. The rest of the LinkedIn profile is pretty straightforward. So you put in your jobs, you put in your, um, you know, where you work, where you've studied and so forth. And LinkedIn will often do the work for you. So if you put in University of Southern Queensland, uh, both for your degree and if you work here, you get the logo. LinkedIn does that for you. You don't need to go find the LinkedIn, uh, the logo. You do have to be careful that you are filling in the word so that LinkedIn recognizes it. Because I do sometimes see people that they might have a, a spelling mistake. And obviously spelling mistakes are not a good idea. Um, but also that means that it won't, LinkedIn won't recognize you as working at that organization or having studied at that organization. So you won't actually be connected with the other people there. Um, and it also means quite often that that logo won't come up, which means that your, your um, profile might not be as interesting as it could be. Something to note is that you can attach links or videos or documents to jobs and also to your profile. So I could put something here if I wanted to, if I, if I had a video um, 
you know, maybe I do a webinar like this that I think is really fantastic and I want the world to see that as evidence of my work, I could, up, I could put a link to the YouTube or I could upload a video. And I've done that, as you can see, for my job here. I've written a, a, a book chapter that got published, so that's pretty cool. I'm pretty proud of that and I want people to know, so I've attached it to the description of my current job and I did it for previous jobs as well. Education, um, you should add all of your tertiary education. I don't think high school needs to be on LinkedIn, although it can also still connect you to people. So actually just yesterday here in Queensland in Brisbane, I met someone who went to the same high school as me in New Zealand. So that was pretty cool. And so LinkedIn could actually have connected him to me if we had our high school on there, but I don't think it's really that necessary. And don't forget that you can actually put in descriptions of everything. So for example, if I'm doing a doctorate, not everybody will understand what I'm really doing. So I'll put in a bit of description there. Um, my certificates are fairly straightforward. And in my undergraduate, I was a student rep. So I've been able to put that down there as well. Skills and endorsements are quite interesting. So skills, you up to, I think, 50 skills. And LinkedIn will actually suggest some... Uh, some skills based off my profile. So I should, probably should put education in, I'll put coaching as well, and public speaking, which I'm doing right now. So there we go. And then you can see that it's been endorsed by other people, and that's because this means that 47 people have said, yes, Michael is good at research. Now, that's quite cool to think that 40, 47 people agree with me on that, but to be honest with you, not everybody who clicked that button to say that I do know that know that about me. So endorsements are sort of not really what they seem. Don't put too much stock in them. But having said that, the skills that you put on your profile are useful because they all contribute to that picture that LinkedIn builds of you and it, it forms, um, it informs how you connect with people, how you show up in searches, how you get recommended different things, all those algorithms that LinkedIn does, just like Facebook or Amazon or anything like that. The more stuff you have there to signal what's relevant to you, the more um, benefit you're going to get in return. So skills and endorsements are uh, useful, but not super important. Recommendations are much more useful and important than endorsements. So recommendations are where someone actually will write um, a little bit of a, a reference or a little bit of an endorsement of you. And so you can see that Eric and Phoenix um, both did that for me. Now, the little secret that I have here is that Eric didn't just decide one day that he was going to write something on my LinkedIn profile. I, I actually asked him to do that. In fact, I asked Eric and Phoenix, um, I proposed that we all get together and we share LinkedIn endorsements. So I wrote one for Eric and Phoenix. Phoenix one wrote one for me and Eric, and Eric wrote one for me and Phoenix. So we got together and said, this is what we want to do. Um, and it's all truthful, it's all sincere, but it was just a nice way to share that around. There's other sections, accomplishments and certificates and publications and blah, 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 interests. So, you know, you don't need to go overboard and fill out every little piece of the LinkedIn profile because the fact is no one, I really don't know that anyone's going to scroll down far enough. And certainly they probably don't care that 10 years ago I got a scholarship. So um, focus on the top part of the profile. Those are the most important parts, particularly that profile and particularly the two or three most recent jobs. So that takes me back, um, whoops. So just to sum up that little bit there, pay attention in particular, not to say that this is the only thing that you do, but you do need to pay a little bit more attention to your photo, your headline and your summary. Do write the profile with your goals in mind. So like I was saying, don't just use your job title, your current job title or your current job description or your current status as a student. Don't focus on that. Focus a little bit on writing the profile with your goals in mind. So you can talk about the future. You can talk about your plans and your aspirations. Because this is really all about the professional that you want to be um, if you're not quite there yet. So a quick poll again. Based on some of that advice that I've given about profiles, what might you do to improve your LinkedIn profile after this webinar? webinar? Throw a couple of ideas in the chat and we'll see what happens.
So if anything came up in that last little bit that you just let me know. It's good feedback for me to know that um, something that I've said is, is having an impact. Put it in the chat. Redo my summary and refine it. And look, David, that's something that we should always be doing. Um, even just when I was looking at my own summary there, I thought, uh, I might make a, a small change to that. Uh, I don't know if that's quite accurate anymore. Um, I might update it. So it's great to see people saying, let's look at those summaries. Someone needs to have another look at the profile photo. Um, but I'm really pleased in particular to see you guys highlighting the summaries because I think of anything on LinkedIn, that is absolutely the most important thing. Um, I just saw a question there from Margaret about um, finding me in particular. Um, I'll, I'll talk in a little bit de in more detail about premium and I'm about to talk to, about how to connect with people. So just hold on there and I think I'll answer your question. Um, so yeah, good to see you guys are thinking about your profiles. It's not an easy thing to write, so feel free to connect with the careers and employability team at USQ to get feedback on, on your profile if you want to make sure that it's communicating what you think is important or you know, if you want to get some feedback on it. So just before I go any further, it is important to talk about privacy because um, LinkedIn is a social network and we know from the news about some of the um, things that happen on social network, sometimes without our knowledge. So there's a couple of important privacy settings that I want to highlight. And again, I'll go back to Chrome. So the, first of all, the way to find it is to click on your own little face up there and then there's a, it takes you to the settings and privacy. First of all, it's important to note that for some people, um, they don't want to be or they shouldn't be on LinkedIn. I have met people that work in jobs where they don't necessarily want any old person to be able to find them, such as um, police officers. I've met a few detectives that said, no, I don't use LinkedIn because I don't want people to, to learn about me. And child protection is another example. So, you know, if you are in an area where you think that your personal safety is important or, or there's some sort of risk to being out there in the public, so to speak, um, you know, do consider it. And, and again, you're welcome to come and talk to us about this if you think it's an issue. And then unfortunately there are people that have had, you know, stalkers or people that they don't, you know, they don't want to be found. So if you're in that situation, then do think carefully about, you know, using LinkedIn because there are privacy settings and I'll show in particular, you know, first of all, you can be, you can edit your public profile to show what do people see, you know, when they search for you, as you can see, I'm, I'm very, very much open. Um, who can see your contact details, who can see your connections and so on, your last name, your organization. You can basically change all those to filter down the kind of um, information you want to provide. Um, but two key areas here are your profile viewing options. What this means is that what do other people see when you click on their profile? And so I'll show you what this looks like from my end. If I get notifications every now and again, I've got a new one. So Katie Robertson Calc viewed my profile and I can click on that and I can see, first of all, how many people have been viewing and who they are. And so for some people, they're not quite comfortable with that. They want to be able to look at people's profile. Whoopsie. They want to look at, be able to look at people's profile without necessarily sending them a signal that they've done that. Um, so that's something that you need to consider. And if you're not comfortable with, um, you know, potentially somebody who you click on um, getting that notification, you should choose one of these other um, settings. Bear in mind that the purpose of LinkedIn is to connect with people and to be seen by people and to be known in your industry. So if you're going to shut down your privacy settings to an extent where no one can see you, um, it's kind of what's the point of being on LinkedIn in the first place. So just do be cautious about that. I understand that people want to be private. I understand people that want to protect them. Um, you know, uh, their information, but at the same time, you have to think about why are you, why do you want to be on LinkedIn in the first place? Personally, I have no problem with people getting these notifications because I'm generally not looking at anyone's profile without a reason. Um, and I'm confident that anytime I click on someone's profile, they will, they will be able to understand why I might've done that. So for example, you can see a leadership coach, a careers practitioner, a career advisor, 
someone who works at another university. Um, I know this person personally. Um, so I, 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 I have no sort of, there's no guesswork for me. I understand why any one of these people might have connected. It's not a problem. And in fact, a little trick or a little technique that you can use is if you're going for a job interview and you know who's going to be your interviewer, you can look them up on LinkedIn and make sure that you view their profile because if you're lucky, they'll get a notification saying that the, this candidate who you're interviewing tomorrow just looked at your profile. And that can leave a good impression because it shows that you're um, doing your research. It so it shows that you're engaged and it shows that you are, um, you know, and it gives them a chance to look at your profile and learn a little bit more about you. So consider that particular setting profile viewing options. And then the other one that you need to be careful about is sharing profile edits. What this means is that if I go in and update my profile, even if it's just to correct a spelling mistake or even if it's just to add something really small, when I save that, LinkedIn will send out a notification to my whole network saying, Michael Healy updated his profile and he changed you know, his education from this to that. Sometimes that's useful. So when you get a new job and you change your new job, you want the whole world to know. You want to celebrate that. You want to tell your network that you're moving to a new place. You want all, everyone to congratulate you and you know, be aware of it. But it can also be kind of embarrassing. Like if you're just making a slight change to your profile or if you're like trying to shift towards a new career or you're making an angle towards a leadership position or something like that, you might not want everyone to get that blasted out to them. So just be conscious of that. What I do is I always turn this off when I'm going to edit my profile, unless it's something that I do want people to know, unless it's me sort of sharing a success or an achievement. So just be conscious of that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other um, settings and things, which you, you know, I won't go through them all because frankly, I don't, know what all of them are but it's important on any social media platform that you do that work to understand how the platform works and what the privacy settings are so two things to be conscious of there is your visit your visibility when viewing other people's profiles and sharing profile edits do understand and use the linkedin privacy settings but at the same time don't forget the reason for using linkedin and shut your profile down so tight that you may as well not have one anyway. So I'm gonna move on to how to connect with people because that's the whole purpose of LinkedIn. There we go. So let me just close that tab. So there's a couple of things to be very careful with on LinkedIn. So if you click on my network, this is where it opens up new people that you, you might wanna connect with. There's one thing that you should very, very carefully avoid with LinkedIn, and that's over here. It's basically connect with your contacts and never lose touch. They make it sound like something, a really useful tool. If I continue, they're saying that we have found 64 people that you know, and the reason they know that is that they've actually used my Gmail contacts, which I must have given them permission to do at some point, They've searched my Gmail contacts and then they've looked for those people on LinkedIn and they're suggesting that I know them. And maybe I do know them, but I don't necessarily want to connect with them. And so I can tell you that my ex-girlfriend from about 15 year ago, years ago was in there. And so was her mum. So I, I'm not really interested in connecting with them on LinkedIn. So I'm going to avoid that tool because it's also suggesting people that I bought something off Gumtree. I bought a bike off someone in Gumtree five years ago, their name's in there. So avoid that because it's really just more, more hassle than it's worth. But what you can do is you can look at this page recommended for you and you'll see a lot of um, people that are recommended for me. You might notice that there's a lot of Vietnamese people and that's because I lived in Vietnam for a while and LinkedIn hasn't quite caught up to the fact that I, I don't live in Vietnam anymore, but no matter. What you should avoid on this page is clicking this button here, connect. So I, I know I do actually know Paul and I may want to connect with him, but I'm not going to click on that button. And I'd like to ask you if you know why. If you know why I'm not going to click on that button, throw it into the chat box and let, let us know what the problem with that is.
Anyone got an idea? If I push this button, if I click on connect, what's going to happen? What what message gets sent out? Not genuine enough. So you're on the right track, David. A generic message, yeah. So if I click that, that's the end of it. My, an invitation goes out to Paul, automated by LinkedIn, and it says, Michael Healy would like to connect with you on LinkedIn, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it means that I don't get to um, customize my message. I don't get to write an email or a message to say, hi, Paul, I, th this is what I know, you know, this is how we know each other, or I met you the other day at this event, um, I'd like to connect, or, or, you know, I'm looking for someone who might be able to help me with something. You know, so you really need to avoid send, just clicking on these buttons to to connect with people. So it's not like Facebook. You do want to um, you do want to send those messages. What you should do instead is to click on their profile. And when you click on their profile, you can then send the customized message to them to say, um, you know, why you're connecting with them, and you can do that. So in terms of connecting with people, the key thing to avoid is just to avoid using that connect button. Always send the customized message when you can. So customize your connection request. Don't just click the connect button. It's also important to recognize different approaches to networking. So um, not everybody is just open to connections from anyone at all. Um, it's important to consider how they might be approaching networking, particularly on LinkedIn. Some people will only connect with people that they know. Others will connect with anybody. So along those lines, don't be offended if someone doesn't accept or respond. They might just not have seen the request in the first place. They might, you know, be taking a break from LinkedIn. Or they may have received a request, but they might not quite understand why you're trying to connect with them. Which explains in part that the importance of that personalized message. But generally, sometimes people just think, well, I don't quite get what you, why you want to connect with me, so I'm not going to accept it. That's just a fact of life. You can't really... Um, Take that personally. If you still want to connect with them, you're going to have to try another way to, to do that. Which uh, brings me to the next poll. Just quickly, what's your style of networking? So you'll see a poll come up. So how do you approach LinkedIn networking? We'll just see if there's um, you, if we tend to be in the same group or if there's a bit of um, variation in that. So the results, uh, we're pretty, we've got a pretty strong agreement there. There's a few people that are open to anyone, a few people that are a little bit more cautious, but 63% of people, including myself, I don't need to know people, but they must be relevant. So anytime I get that connection request, I'll usually look at their headline. I talked about the importance of the headline. If the headline seems relevant to me, I'll look at their profile and I'll read the summary. And if the summary catches my attention, I'll probably accept if I understand how they're connected to me. So I showed you earlier those, you know, a few people in the in the career development um, profession viewed me. If they sent a connection request, I'd absolutely, I'd happily accept because they're part of my professional community. When uh, insurance salesmen or real estate people send me connection requests, I often don't because I'm not in insurance or real estate. So the only reason I can think of them wanting to connect with me is um, to sell me stuff. So, you know, that's the decision I'm making. There's no right or wrong answer to that. I tend to believe that, you know, being more open is better because you really do just want to expand your opportunities, but it's a decision for each person to make. So, um, you know, I'm not saying one, one way is better than the other necessarily, but it's important that you consider it and make sure that you're making a decision based on what's best for you. The best thing, one of the best things about LinkedIn is being able to do research. Um, and I'm often surprised at how little research people do using LinkedIn because I actually think that it's one of the best research tools in terms of job applications, career development in general. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of particular areas. So first of all, you can just do searches. So um, I mentioned I lived in Vietnam. So I was in Vietnam. I was working at an Australian university doing career development and I wanted to come to Australia. 
and but I wasn't sure how competitive I would be in the job market. So I went to LinkedIn and I searched for career consultant or career advisor. I did, did a couple of searches and I searched them and I looked at the people. And so I was looking at the profile of peoples of people who have uh, who are career consultants in Australia. And I found a whole bunch of people. And what I, what I did was I just looked at each of their profiles and I looked at what kind of education they have. I looked at what kind of skills they have. I looked at their career pathways to see what sort of work they've done. And I looked at their summaries to see how they describe themselves. And what I identified from that was that I had pretty good experience and I had pretty good skills, but there was a qualification that everybody had, a, um, a graduate certificate in career development that I did not have. So my conclusion was that I wouldn't be very competitive because it seemed like that was a requirement. And so my next step was to enroll in that course. So that's an example of how I use LinkedIn to do a bit of research and to make a decision and to learn something that I needed to do to meet my career goals. So that was really straightforward and simple. That was quite just as easy as, as searching for a job title. You can also um, search for particular skills. So for example, um, workshop facilitation is something that I do or something that I'm good at. And so again, you can see that Megan here, she doesn't have it in her job or in her headline, and it's probably not a job title, but she has listed it as a skill. Alan has listed it as a skill. A whole bunch of people have listed it as skills. So once again, I could see, well, if I'm good at this skill, what sort of jobs are available to me? So I can see career consulting, university, strategy and strategic planning, project management. So, you know, if I knew that I was good at something, but I wasn't quite sure what kind of jobs I could do that in, this is another way that I could build that knowledge. We can start to be a bit more specific. We can start to look at particular employers. So again, I wanted, I know that I like working at universities, so I can look at any university with, um, here as an employer. And I'll just use USQ as an example, the University of Southern Queensland. First of all, I can follow the USQ and then I get the information and the updates in my newsfeed on LinkedIn. I can also look at jobs, you, and I'll come to jobs in a, uh, later on. But what I was really interested when I knew that I was, you know, thinking about applying for a job here was to look at the 2,000 odd employees of USQ who have LinkedIn profiles. And so once again, I was able to sort of see, am I connected to any? Um, who do I know? Who, do I, who don't know? Who don't I know? I was able to get a, get a sort of sense of who, who works here, what kind of people work here. And in particular, I could use some filters and look at things like um, their job title. And so I could look for people working in particular areas and get some knowledge around that. Now, if I were looking for, you know, an internship or something, then I would be able to may, maybe sort of connect with people. I might think that, you know, um, a manager of a department or a team leader or someone like that could be someone that I could connect with and then send, in, send them an email and say, hey, I'd really like to develop my experience in this area. I wonder if you're open to taking me on as a intern or letting me visit and do a, you know, showing me around or having a cup of coffee with me, something as simple as that. So by looking at an organization and, you know, we could look at all sorts of different places like Telstra, for example. So you can see 36,910 employees on, on LinkedIn. Obviously you're going to need to use these filters. First of all, you might decide, well, you know, I only want to look at people in Brisbane but you probably want to look at some of these other filters such as in particular their job title or maybe some, some sort of industries or things and so on to, to reduce this number. And you would have to go through and, and refine your search so that you know that you're looking at the right people. Um, because if you just do these broad searches, you're just going to be overwhelmed with the number of results. So that's using LinkedIn to research companies or organizations because even like, um, government departments like the uh, Department of Education, uh, Queensland Department of Education. So they, they have these pages just like any other employer. 
And so once again, you could use that to find out who is doing the kind of work that you want, who's someone that might be able to give you some advice, and certainly also then to look at jobs and, um, and try to figure those things out. So that's looking at organizations as employers, but the great thing about LinkedIn is you can also use universities um, in another way, which is really fantastic. And it's actually this button here, the alumni tool. So the alumni tool is the thing that I find that most people don't know about. Um, and it is possibly one of the most useful tools on LinkedIn. So when you click on that, you can see that we've got 47,813 alumni of USQ. So it's put through its fair share of graduates over the years. You have to bear in mind that they're only the graduates who have LinkedIn profiles. So we're not capturing every single person who's ever studied here. We're only capturing the people that have put USQ on their LinkedIn profile. And then once again, we can start to filter. So we can filter by location, where they work, and it's quite interesting, most, the majority, you know, the largest employer of USQ is USQ. That's interesting. But the better part is over on the next page, what did they study? So that is where probably the most useful thing to do is, and if you studied something like, let's say, media, um, communication media studies, we're down to 248. Um, and remember, that's only the people that have LinkedIn profile, so you're not going to be capturing anyone, everyone. Um, and then once again, you might be looking at, in particular, someone who does, um, let's say, social media marketing. And now we've reduced that down to 48. And then let's say, you know, that's probably a good number where you could start to, to look around at the profiles and see where do they work, what do they do, how did they get there, what other education might they have, any number of things you could be doing to learn more about people. And there's someone that I should connect with. Um, I work closely with Samantha, so I'll, I'll come back and do that later on. I, don't, I won't click on her profile because I don't know that she wants me to broadcast um, her profile to the world. Um, you can also look at their sort of industry in which they work. So maybe you, you're interested in communications, maybe you're interested in social media marketing, maybe you want, you're interested in education. And so there you click on that and you would end up with five people or seven people who based on your filters and based on your search are really closely aligned with what you want to do. So they're natural people for you to network with, maybe connect with, ask some questions, get some information and see what comes of that. So this alumni tool is really fantastic and really useful. If you are from overseas or if you are, you know, globally mobile, you can use this for sort of instant professional networks. So for example, I don't know if you've noticed in the way that I speak, but I'm not from around here. I'm from New Zealand and I studied at the University of Waikato. And when I came to Australia, I used this tool. And what I did first of all was I said, I wonder if there's anyone who studied history at the University of Waikato, which that's what my undergraduate was. And I wonder if there's anyone who studied history and lives in Melbourne, because that's where I went when I came back from Vietnam. And here we go. There's not everybody's shown up because I actually connected with most of them. But you could see a number of people here that studied the degree that I studied at the university at which I studied who live in Melbourne, where I lived. And so because I knew a few people there, but I didn't know a lot, they actually, I identified a few people, like they were friends of mine, and I could connect with them. I'm just curious now. Ah, it's me. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. I'm all on my own in Toowoomba as a history graduate of the University of Waikato. I don't mind that. I don't mind being a bit unique. So the, the alumni tool is fantastic, particularly if you're an international student. You know, so for example, I've worked with people that... Um, They've studied overseas and they come here for a master's degree. Let me, oh, what's going on? I've lost my mouse. I have lost my mouse. That's okay. So I'll come back to that if I can. My mouse is back. Okay, so I'll come back to that. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. So research in your field, do search for job titles. Um, skills and disciplines, do search 
follow and research organizations. Something you should be able to do is to name a handful of employers that you would love to work for if you got the opportunity to. If you can't do that, then that's something you need to do some reflection and try and figure out. And once you do that, you can then go to LinkedIn and you can gather some really amazing intelligence. And do use the alumni finder tool. You don't actually have to be an alumni of that university to use that tool. So we could go and look at graduates of Harvard if we wanted to. You don't have to have gone to that university to use it. Um, and I'll just quickly demonstrate what I wanted to demonstrate for you. So for example, if you went to um, University of, I don't know, Chile, you can use this tool. And what you can then do is you could then search, is there anyone here in Toowoomba? If you live in Toowoomba or wherever you might live. And we've got one person. So there you go, there's an instant network. Or you might just look at um, Queensland or you might look at people who are in your field. And so I've, I've worked with a lot of international students in particular or people from other countries where we've done, we've used that tool and they've been really amazed to find out that there's people really, really like them um, quite close to them. So that can be really fa uh, fantastic. A quick tip about that though is don't take everything at face value because um, our LinkedIn profiles, are, you know, they're like our resumes. They've always got a little bit of nuance, a little bit of polish. Um, and people don't put everything on their resume, on their LinkedIn profile. So if you, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you're not, you're not getting the whole story. You're not seeing every job I've ever applied for. You're not even seeing everything I've ever studied. You're seeing what I want you to know. So just bear that in mind. You can't take everything at face value and assume that you can figure out what the story was because often there's the story behind the story. That means that you can't make important decisions without actually talking to people. So if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you're not going to know how did I get into the area that I'm in. Um, you're going to have to talk to me to find that out. Um, you're not going to recognize, you're not going to be able to see what the challenges were, for example. You're going to have to ask me if you want to know that. So. This tool is really fantastic for research, but don't um, leave it without taking it that step further and talking to people. Just quickly looking for work, LinkedIn does have jobs on it and it is really useful for that. So the tab up here at the top is jobs, obviously click on that. A couple of things you can do is you can edit your career interests and this tells LinkedIn and others what you're into. You can even send, a, you can put on a setting to say to people, hey, I'm looking for work. Um, I'm not doing that because I'm not looking for work. You can also sort of set some statuses and then where and what you're looking for. That's really important to do because if you don't do that, then this function, jobs you may be interested in is going to be really um, useless and redundant. Um, someone was talking a bit about premium accounts. So premium uh, is not actually necessary. Most of what I've done in this webinar so far can be done with a free account. The exceptions are that um, you only get notifications about who viewed your profile. You only get all of them if it, with a, pre, a premium account. If you have a free, free account, it will only show you some of them. Having a free account also limits the number of messages you can send. It makes it a little bit more difficult to connect with people. It um, doesn't show as many searches, and in fact, you're limited in the number of searches that you can do. So if you're going to be doing some intensive research, you might find that you run out of um, the number of searches that you can run or the number of results that you get. And at that point, you might think about taking on a premium profile. They cost about $35 a month, um, and they can be useful if you're using it. So only sign up for premium if you are intensively researching or intensively job searching. If you're not doing either of those two things, it's probably not worth it. The good thing is you can, um, you know, you can activate it for a month and then turn it off and they stop charging you and you can reactivate it later on. And they also have a free one month um, premium trial so you can use it and see if it's for you. Um, but the jobs is useful and, you know, because I have a premium account, it shows me where I'm a top applicant. So it says, you know, I'm, in the top 10% of this job at the University of Auckland. And it will show me why I am in the top 10%. So it's rating my skills and past experience really well. It's um, saying that I've got the right kind of qualification. Um, and it gives, it's giving me intelligence about people that I know who work at that university. 
And it's even telling me, this is really interesting, it's telling me the people that if I get that job, who might I be working with? So that's really useful. So if I was going to go for this job, I would click on Sam's and Sarab's um, profiles to evaluate myself against them because they're in that job. So I may as well go and look at how do I stack up against them to rate my um, confidence or to develop my knowledge of how I might um, apply for that job. What might I highlight? What might my, what might my weakness be? And so forth. I would highly recommend that you make browsing jobs a habit. Even if you're not looking for work, it's really useful just to understand what the what's out there, what the trends are, what's available and what's what's happening. So one thing I know, for example, I see lots of jobs from RMIT online, and that means one of two things. One of the, the first thing might be that lots of people leave because it's not a good place to work, or it might mean that it's a great place to work, they're developing, they're building, they're growing, and they need more people. And I know for a fact that it's the second one because I know people that work there. But by looking at LinkedIn's jobs, I've noticed that this is a trend. And so if I were looking for work, if I wanted to move back to Melbourne, this would be something that I'd probably be thinking about or doing more research into. So do edit your career interests. Do make a habit of browsing those jobs. Premium is useful, but you don't need to be in a rush to sign up for it. Um, and also don't expect immediate results. So don't think that you're gonna click around on LinkedIn for a couple of weeks and someone's gonna come and offer you a job. It doesn't work like that. It's really something that's gotta be a, a habit, an ongoing sort of activity. And don't limit your sources of opportunity. So don't just look at LinkedIn is what I mean by that. You need to continue looking at those other websites. Participating and engaging is really essential. So um, actually I'll stay on the slide for that one. You need to use LinkedIn regularly. Don't set it up as an online resume and leave it there. Use it regularly, like, comment, share, and post. The reason for that is that every time you like something, um, it sends a signal out, it's, it shows up on people's profiles and so on. So um, here, Judy Kay, she's just shared a job, um, you know, from, from her friend Adam. So, you know, that's fantastic. I'm gonna like that. I'm not looking for the job, but I want Judy to know that I'm you know, I'm, I'm engaged, I'm paying attention, I'm, I'm listening to her. Scott Westray likes this thing, which is quite an interesting piece of research. So I know now that Scott is, um, he's up with the play in his field. So the liking, the sharing and the commenting is just a great way to engage and send out little signals. I'm not gonna, actually gonna post it because I need to write something a bit more intelligent, but that would be sending a signal to him um to say thanks for that mate i appreciated it um and recognize that he's doing well to be on top of um developments in his area that's how people build a knowledge of you so people who know me on linkedin they know what i'm all about because of the stuff that i share because of the stuff that i like because of the comments that i make it's not all about what i write about myself on the profile it's about the behaviors that, that i exhibit in my use of linkedin try not to be too self-promotional don't go out looking to impress everybody just be your authentic self. Share what interests you, share what challenges you have. Um, and in particular, don't forget professionalism because we have seen people mess up. And I'd like just quickly, have you ever seen somebody embarrass themselves on social media? What did they do? Throw that in the chat. Um, is there any behavior that you've seen that hasn't reflected well on someone? What was that behavior that we should all avoid? Just while you're typing that in, So I've seen people update jobs that they didn't actually get. And they were just sort of trying it out for size and they accidentally pressed save and then their whole network got that message that they'd got a job that they didn't actually get. So that was quite embarrassing for them. I also see people on LinkedIn, you know, get into political discussions quite a lot. There's nothing wrong with that because a lot of people's jobs are political, but you know, you want to avoid getting into flame wars and so on. We'll move on from that because we're running out of time a little bit. But just think about your professionalism. Think about some of the behaviors that you might have seen that didn't reflect well on people. And just remember that LinkedIn is always going to be a professional network. The last thing I'll talk about is sharing your work because uh, you can also do a great job a lot here to, um, prom to let people know what you're all about. And um, so if you go to your profile, oh, sorry, actually, if you go at the top 
of the timeline, you can see that you can just make an update, like a simple update, like on Facebook. Where is it? It's, it's moved. They've actually changed something, but you can write longer form articles. So I'll show you an example. Just like Facebook, they often change the functions around a little bit, but you can add an article. Here we go, this is probably the way we can do it. Maybe it's just our. Maybe the internet's playing up for us. But this is an example of an article. It's a bit more like a, a blog or you know, it's longer. Um, now, this was actually part of a university assignment that I did. And, you know, I really enjoyed writing it. I thought it was pretty good. My lecturer, you know, I got good grades for it. And then I thought, well, it's kind of a shame that, that the only person who's going to read this is my, my lecturer. So I thought, I'm, I'm going to rewrite it for more of a public sort of thing. And I'll put it up on LinkedIn. And you can see I've had views and I've had likes and I've had comments and shares. And that was really fantastic because this is now evidence of my the way that I think and the way that I approach my work. And um, it was just so easy to do because I did that work for an assignment. I rewrote it a little bit. I threw it up on LinkedIn and it got a pretty good response. And I got connections from it and a few people sent me messages. So that's something that you can do. If you've done a video or a presentation or if you've got a website, you can put that up. I recommend repurposing work or study projects, but don't forget your audience. So don't use just the same language that you use for your academic writing. You're gonna to need to make it a little, little bit more accessible, a little bit more engaging. And also don't breach confidentiality because I have seen people talk about workplace challenges and they're probably going a little bit too much into detail so that you know sort of who they're talking about or they're, you know, there's some trade secrets sort of thing. So that brings me to the end. I've covered quite a lot of ground. I talked about Profiles, how to set them up. I've talked about how to connect with people. I've gone into how to research organizations and, and using the alumni full tool. But most of all, I've recommended participating on LinkedIn, using it on a regular basis, doing small things like sharing, posting, liking, commenting, maybe putting up a longer article or two. Because LinkedIn is not an online resume, it's a social media network. And the more that you use it, the more that um, things are going to come back to you and the more that you're going to notice and learn things. So I'm more than happy to talk about LinkedIn if you'd like to connect with us to get a, get some feedback on your profile or some advice on how you might do some research. You can you can get it, get to us from um, just the USQ website, search for careers, and I'd really encourage you to talk to us about that because it is such a useful tool and there's a lot to learn about it. So thanks for your time. Hopefully we still have a bit of time for some questions. I know I've gone a little bit over. Yeah, not a problem, Michael. We will get started with just a couple of questions that have come through. Um, so the first question we have is from Carl. So how does an average person stand out from the masses of people on LinkedIn? Um, why would someone want to connect with him if he's not a standout with academic achievements or amazing attributes? That's a good question. And look, I, Carl, I think the answer is that you don't need to stand out. You don't need to be the top academically. You don't need to be, you know, a trailblazer in your profession. You just need to be a good, honest person who connects with people who share your interests. Um, you know, so don't go out of your way to try and stand out. Just connect with, start by connecting with people that you know. Start there, that's easy. Um, and then over time, you'll start to see that, you know, LinkedIn recommends similar to people to you. And at the same time, you're being recommended to those people as well. And so they're gonna look at your profile and you can just basically you know, state the facts. This is what I'm studying. This is the work that I do. Um, you're not claiming to be the best at everything. You're just saying, look, I'm a good, reliable person. I'm engaged in my profession. I'm connected to other people and I'm keen to connect with more. So that's really all you need to do. And then in terms of um, being active on LinkedIn, you know, if you're thinking about your profession, you're reading news articles, you're reading reports, um, you're thinking about the problems of the day, just share them up on LinkedIn and just say, look, I, I read this article on the weekend in the newspaper. It's really relevant to my work and I think that it can help us do something better. And people will comment and connect them on that. So just don't put that pressure on yourself to be like, um, you know, shining bright. Just be yourself. Um, be your professional self, you know. 
Great. Thanks, Michael. We just have another question from Sharissa just asking, she's received messages from potential employees expressing interest in her profile. Well, She's happy where she is now, but how does she politely decline without burning bridges? Well, first of all, well done because, um, you know, you're clearly doing things right on LinkedIn that people are starting to sort of contact you. Um, look, you, you want, you're not burning bridges to say no thank you. Um, I would... Personally, I've, I've had that happen. I've often actually had the conversation. I have talked to them and I've said, just tell me more about it um, because I'm just curious more than anything. Like you, I wasn't intending to do to move. So I think you're, you can allow yourself to actually learn more about it because you could basically find out what they see in you or you could find out about the opportunity and it might give you some ideas for the future. But at the end of the, end of the day, if you say to someone, hey, thanks for that, I appreciate it, the fact is I'm really happy where I am and I'm not really in a place where I'm looking to change jobs. No one's going to begrudge you for that. That's not unprofessional. That's not burning bridges. That's just being very honest. It's not wasting anybody's time. Um, and you might be able to say also something like, I'd like to connect with you because, you know, in the future I might be in a different situation and I'd be keen to hear from you. So, you know, just be upfront, just be, you know, honest and just say thanks, but no thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. We just have another question come through in regards to removing connections. Is there an easy way to do it instead of just one by one? And what's more professional, add and accept people who you feel good when you don't know them? Or um, That's interesting. Um, I don't know that there's a way to remove connections other than just going one by one. I think LinkedIn makes it difficult because part of LinkedIn's um, business is connections. They want more connections rather than less. Um, in terms of the professionalism, look, I don't think being open to anyone is unprofessional. I think personally it doesn't work for me because it dilutes the quality of my network. I want my network to be primarily higher education, career development, um, that sort of stuff. That's what works for me. So that's why I'm a little bit more careful. I don't think it's a matter of professionalism. Um, personally, I find that the relevant but not necessarily knowing them in real life works well for me. So I've just learned that over time. And I think that's something that you can do. If you've made a career change where you've gone from being more of an entrepreneur or, you know, doing coaching and stuff where you've got to be marketing yourself and you've made a change, perhaps then obviously that might be a little bit difficult to manage at times, but you know, that's part of the process of making a career change. Thanks, Michael. So we just have the last two questions for today. Uh, should you be wary of any gaps in your career history on LinkedIn? Uh, yes, uh, just like on a resume, a big gap can sometimes stand out, um, but you can often put something in there to explain it. So I'm a big fan of whether it's on a resume or a LinkedIn profile, just um, being honest and, and stating the facts. So if you were traveling, you might say I was traveling, you know, during this time, if you had a family, you could say that I had a family between these years. Um, you know, so if you're, if you're really unsure about how to communicate a career gap, I think the best thing you can do is come talk to us at the careers and employability team because there's different kinds of career gaps, everything from having a family through to being locked up. So, um, you know, obviously you have to handle them a bit differently. So we're really happy to talk you through that and um, find a way for you to communicate that the best way that you can. Great. Thanks, Michael. Last question for today is how do you change your background photo on LinkedIn? Uh, you just go to your profile, you go to your own profile and there will be a button there saying edit your profile and that's where you would edit your um, summary or add, add a new job or anything. And they'll just, just like on Facebook or whatever, there'll be um, a little bit of a icon of a camera, I think, that you click on. It's really straightforward and easy. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Michael. That wraps up today's session. So thank you again for Michael for joining us and sharing your knowledge and to all of you for taking part in today's webinar. A reminder that we will be sending you a copy of the presentation slides and recording so you can revisit the material in your own time. Um, I am currently running a quick feedback poll, so if you could please spare the time to let us know what you thought of today's presentation, we'd appreciate your feedback. Um, our next webinar is all about entrepreneurship, learning what this term means and how to use the entrepreneurship mindset to stand out from the crowd. Our presenter, Dr. Paul Newbury, will discuss the differences between entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship and how to use it to benefit your career and employment goals. So if you are interested, make sure you visit usq.edu.au slash webinars to register for the session. We'll see you then.